Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this unexpectedly sunny spring evening. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you that haven't met Leona, uh, please wave to Leona, even though she can't see you. <laughs> and thank you, Leona, for being the backbone and the foundation of our Empowering Patients program. We've been doing this for over six years. And really, I think it's I think this is our sixth year. Might be longer. It might be longer. <laughs> it might be longer. It might be eight years. But this is our second year doing it virtually, and it's worked out really well because we have over 100 people registered this time. So that's awesome. We can't fit them all into the library <laughs> or one of our community centers. Um, so I'd like to introduce Leona and thank her again for everything she can to facilitate and make this possible. And of course, we're both working for the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. So that's the nonprofit association of the family doctors that look after patients in the Burnaby area, although many of our patients are outside of Burnaby because uh, we're all part of the greater community. So Leona has shared some helpful links that are in the chat. So I'm just gonna ask Leona to just give you a, a brief summary of what's available for these uh, really interesting links that will probably have value outside of our topic for today. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so I will be populating the chat. They're not quite there yet. But uh, so what I'm going to put in the chat is our Empowering Patients page, which will include all recordings of all of our talks over the last year. Unfortunately, this is our last talk of the season. So um, Dr. Wong and I are going to do some brainstorming and see if we can come up with a program for the fall. So um, stay tuned for that. Also, I'm going to post a link to all of the resources. So the information sheets and the presentations that Dr. Wong puts together um, will be, there'll be uh, links to PDFs for those. Um, I'm going to put a link to our Burnaby PCN website that offers many social supports, uh, including our community fridge, senior supports, some digital lit literacy and more. Uh, Doc Talk, so another um, virtual uh, education program that we put on. Um, I'm going to put up the provincial COVID dashboard that gives you numbers on COVID um, across BC or in your health authority. Um, those numbers aren't updated as often as they used to be daily, but now I believe they're doing them once a week. So I'll put that in there. Um, I'm going to put a link to our COVID roundup. So we have a, a team of three of us that put together that vet some news and information resources and put it into a uh, a, a newsletter comes out every Friday. I'm going to put the link to the April 8th um, uh, issue, and you can just register to that if you're interested in update, updated COVID information, if you're not sick of COVID already. And um, I'll just comment that at the end of tonight's talk, uh, we're going to, um, when, you, when I close off the, the session, uh, a survey evaluation is going to pop up if you wouldn't mind taking some time to um, to uh, just fill that out for us. The information is really valuable. So I will start populating and I'll let Dr. Wong um, get on with the talk. Thank you, Leona. Those links are so useful and they're really handy as well for about food security. So if any of you are really struggling to get food on the table, um, there's the useful link um, through our primary care network. The PCN or the primary care network is a, uh, Burnaby Division of Family Practice and Fraser Health and a lot of the other community organizations, nonprofit organizations that are working together to support everyone during the pandemic and beyond. So it's a great network because we're all in charge of looking after everyone in our community. So today's topic is on healthy eating. And this is a picture of my favorite fruit, which is an apple. And I every day I eat at least three apples a day, some days, five apples. So I buy two big bags from Costco every week and I share a few of them with my kids. My wife doesn't like apples. They give her a tummy ache. So next slide. Again, the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. We have our own website, divisionsbc.ca slash Burnaby. And you'll find all those resources that Leona has alluded to, as well as links to the Empowering Patients Program and all the videos from our past presentations over the past year. Um, and just to remind you that we're part of a circle of caring. So family docs like myself care about our patients. They have a golden rule in our practice that we have a little sign that none of our patients sees, but it's actually uh, put up in front of my medical office assistant, Christina's desk that says, 
We treat every patient like a family member or a trusted friend. So we give them the same level of care and consideration. We care about our community. That's why we're doing these talks so that we can share information to people beyond our 2,500 patients. And we also care about all of our future. So we care about our patients and our community. That's why most of us are involved in a lot of community activities like the annual walk with your doc. So I could pretty well guarantee in September, we will have a talk and it'll be about healthy physical activity because it'll be timed with our annual walk with your doc. So I'll be there, Leona will be there and a whole bunch of docs in the Burnaby community. So you can come and um, walk with us and talk with us. And hopefully we don't have to wear masks at that time, but we never know, we could do it with masks. So today I'll talk about the four foundations of self-care and why you are what you eat, how diet affects our overall health. I'll go over Canada's food guide, the latest version of that basic Canada food guide, the basics of healthy eating. Uh, we'll give some tips on healthy eating on a budget, which is really topical with the food prices going up with inflation over the past couple of weeks. And a quick review of some popular diets that you might have questions of. And how to, and some tips on making positive changes in our life. How you can get out of bad habits and adopt a few healthy habits. So some really useful practical tips. So what is healthcare? Well, if you ask a family doctor, they'll say only a small part is that acute hospital care, the emergency care that you see on Gray's Anatomy, that the majority is what happens in the community, in your family doctor's office, in community care, and chronic disease management and prevention. But really, who provides most of your health care? And you're right, it's not the doctors and the nurses and the allied health care professionals, but it's you. You provide all pretty well all your health care, the healthy eating, taking medications if you need it, healthy physical activity, maintaining your emotional well-being, um, maintaining your social connections. These are all important, and these are things that you do yourself. And we're here to support you. So real health care is self-care, and you're the one that's most responsible. And the best predictor of your future health, at least those things under control, are the habits we practice today, such as healthy eating. So those four foundations of self-care, looking after ourselves, can be divided into four big groups. What you do, and that includes physical activity, exercise, and balance by rest. The second foundation is how you feel, emotional well-being. And the third foundation is how we connect healthy relationships. And the topic of today, what you eat and what you put into your body. So we can put in some unhealthy things into our body, um, like a high fat diet, unhealthy fats that is, excessive alcohol, cigarettes, and recreational drugs. Because we really are what we eat. And hopefully you don't eat too much gingerbread. Because what we eat is what we use for energy. And it's also the building blocks for all the cells that make up the organs of your body. So it affects the quality of your body and your mind and your overall health. So a healthy diet provides those building blocks to build strong bones and healthy organs, including your brain and your heart and your kidneys, and those muscles that you need to use to get through every day and to do everyday tasks. And a healthy diet provides the vitamins, minerals, and the nutrients to promote healing, supporting the immune system, and preventing cancer. And of course, a healthy diet provides that energy to fuel your body to get through the day. This is my old car, which was destroyed in an accident when a big truck ran into me head on, when I had the right of way, of course, and no one was speeding. But when I had a nice car, I didn't put lousy fuel into the tank. So why would you do that to your body? It looks really yummy, but it's not the best fuel. This would be a healthier fuel for the body, but it wouldn't be so good for my old car. I'm now driving a very energy efficient Honda Clarity. So running on electricity most of the time. So food can harm us if we consume too much fat of the unhealthy fats. And you'll learn later that there are good fats that we need for our health. And there are some unhealthy fats, such as saturated fats. 
So we'll go over the details of what kind of fats are good for our bodies and which ones we should limit. If we have too much salt, too much calories, and too much sugar, this can lead to obesity, osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear arthritis on our weight-bearing joints, like our hips and our knees and our back. It can lead to narrowing of our arteries or what people call hardening of the arteries. That can lead to strokes, chest pain, angina, or heart attacks. It can contribute to diabetes if we're genetically prone, and it can contribute to high blood pressure. So you can see our diet can cause disease, but our diet can be used to help chronic conditions as well. And if we're deficient in some vitamins, that could be harmful as well. So if you don't have enough calcium in your diet or insufficient vitamin D, it can affect the growth of bone, it can lead to osteoporosis or a thinning of the bones and fractures. And if you don't consume enough protein in your diet, that can cause weakness and wasting of your muscles. So any kid that's bodybuilding knows they need extra protein, but we need it at every stage of our life too. So deficiencies in vitamin B12, folate or iron can lead to anemia and therefore tiredness, decreased endurance for physical activities, and it could even affect our thinking. So often in the elderly, that means people just a few years older than me, um, can be deficient in B12, and that can lead to some impairment of cognition. And sometimes replacing that B12 can improve our memory and our thinking as well, if we're deficient. So knowing all that, which most of you know already, why don't we eat better? Well, there's a lot of things that sabotage our best intentions and our knowledge. One is habits. So it's just so easy to go through a drive through It's just so convenient. And then once we get into that habit, it's a no-brainer, so easy to do, to drive through a fast food place and get a quick snack, save so much more time. And we have a lot of comfort food. We have an emotional connection with food, like craft dinner, macaroni and cheese. And we all have a cultural connection with food. So I'm third generation Canadian born Chinese, but I've been to countless Chinese restaurants. So, so many Chinese restaurants. And most of the Chinese restaurant food is very high in carbs. So not so good for diabetes, very high in fat and loaded with sodium in the form of MSG. Um, so not so good for blood pressure as well. So those are three common conditions in Asian people. And often that the diet doesn't work so well. So in all cultures, there are healthy and unhealthy foods. And it's hard to, to change that if the rest of your family is eating the same kind of food. So it takes a lot of work and cooperation with others to change your diet. And also we're constantly being bombarded with television ads. If you watch live TV this evening, you're bound to see a whole bunch of hamburger ads from White Spot and a and or McDonald's and everything looks so mouthwatering and looks kind of pristine. I never seen a Big Mac that looks like this, but when advertising, they just look perfectly shaped buns and nice and juicy and huge. They never actually come out that way. And I learned early on in adulthood that in spite of a craving for something like a McDonald's hamburger or a white spot Monty mushroom burger, you crave for it, it's immediately satisfying, but you end up feeling kind of yucky afterwards either a tummy ache or just feeling that you just didn't right, put the right fuel in your engine. And also the cost. Sometimes it's in the States where fast food is even cheaper, it's not uncommon for normal families to eat out every single day. That seems to be a very common thing in a lot of people I talk to that, are, that live in the States. And sometimes good quality food, like lots of fresh fruits and vegetables or fish, is quite expensive to have on a regular basis. And also, we all have some knowledge of what's good and what's bad, but we're bombarded with information on the internet, on television, and from Dr. Oz, and it's not very objective information. Often people are trying to sell us something. So one objective source for good information 
evidence-based information is Canada's food guide. So it may have changed a lot since you last looked at it. So it was revised in 2019. We actually put, we actually kept on postponing this talk for successive years because they kept promising a new Canada food guide. It took them about two or three years since they announced they were revising it to they actually came out within 2019. So I'll give you the update. So it looks quite different from what you would have seen prior to 2019. So much easier to follow. Um, so in general, half of our plate should be vegetables and fruits. And a quarter of our plate should be protein rich food. So in the past, they would make certain groups like grains, vegetables, fruits, and meat and fish as different groups and you need a particular portion from each. But think of dividing your plate into halves and then two quarters. So half the plate, vegetables and fruits, preferably vegetables for your lunch and dinner meal. And high protein, good quality protein foods that are not terribly high in saturated fats, the unhealthy fats. So that could include lean meat, poultry, chicken breast, fish, beans and lentils, tofu, and other vegetable sources for protein. And the other quarter of the plate would be the starchy foods. And depending on um, your overall health, if you have diabetes, there's particular types of starchy foods that are healthier for you. And drinking water is a good choice for a beverage rather than alcohol or something that's high in sugar. So try to avoid consuming uh, pop or fruit juices. So you need to eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. They contain fiber and that's, the, that's what plant products have that you don't absorb through the bowel. So it actually makes our stools more regular. It may reduce the risk for colon cancer and might reduce the risk for flare-ups of diverticulosis, which is a common condition in our bowel. It provides plenty of vitamins and micronutrients and minerals. And again, it should take up half your plate, so the majority. And it's better to eat whole fruit, like my favorite fruit, the apple, or a whole orange or a banana is better than having them concentrated into fruit juices because we're not meant to burn off all that sugar that we can get from a glass of juice. And for that quarter of the plate that are protein foods, some options would be eggs, particularly egg whites, and then lean meats and poultry. Uh, poultry meaning mainly chicken and turkey breast, um, duck, is a, is a bird as well that we sometimes consider poultry, but it tends to be a, a fat much higher in, in saturated fats. Um, red meat means beef, lamb, and pork. Those are the higher fat meats. So you should, if you have those, you should have leaner cuts like green, uh, lean ground beef. Um, and a lot of people think that pork is white meat because it looks like it's white, but that's considered a red meat. Pretty well, anything from a pig is not good for you. It's funny, we have so many different names like ham and bacon and pork, um, but anything from a pig is high in fat. But other good sources of protein you may not have thought of all the time would be most nuts are actually a healthy type of fat, including peanuts and almonds and cashews, um, almond butter, peanut butter. Those are good sources of healthy fat, but a good source of protein as well. So like some peanut butter, almond butter on whole wheat toast would be a pretty good start for your breakfast with maybe a banana or an orange. And sunflower seeds, another good source of protein. Other sources include fish. So we're thinking more like the swimming fish and to a lesser extent, the shellfish. So the fatty fish like tuna and salmon are really good choices. So salmon is my favorite fish to eat as well. So we have that at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And a kind of a favorite breakfast I grew up with, with my mom was salmon and rice in the morning as a breakfast. Uh, it's good to have lower fat dairy products like skim or 1% milk. It's a good source of protein as well as calcium and vitamin D. Beans, peas, and lentils are also a good source of protein. So one of, one of my sons that lives with us and cooks for us is vegetarian. So he does eat fish as well, 
but doesn't eat the chicken or any of the, the red meats. But we've learned a lot of good vegetarian meals. So almost satisfied eating a totally vegan meal. So beans, peas, and lentils are an excellent substitute for, for animal products for the protein. And you'll also save money um, during the winter on the heating just because everyone has so much gas on a vegetarian diet. Um, fortified soy beverages or tofu or soybeans and other soy products are another good source of protein. We should choose whole grain foods when we're talking about the starches and that includes quinoa, wild rice, whole grain pasta, oatmeal, whole oats, because they're high in fiber, vitamins and minerals. And that again, fiber reduces the risk for stroke, colon cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. We should watch out for those grain products that contain extra sugar and sodium and saturated fat. So we really have to kind of look at the labels. And some of these include certain kinds of breads and muffins and crackers and some pasta dishes. So start looking at the labels if we try to limit our sodium, particularly if you're prone to high blood pressure or heart failure. And choose foods with uh, healthy types of fats instead of saturated fats. So the healthier fats will reduce your risk for heart attacks or ischemic heart disease, narrowing of the arteries. So examples of healthy fats are again, nuts and seeds, avocado, vegetable oils like canola, soft margarine, uh, olive oil, uh, fatty fish that we talked about, like salmon and tuna, trout, herring, mackerel, and when we're cooking, we should choose those that have healthier fats. And that includes corn, oil, olive oil, canola, peanut oil, sesame, soybean, flaxseed, safflower, and sunflower oils. So those are healthy oils to cook with. And of course, we don't cook with lard. Uh, we should avoid the saturated fats. And you'll find those in those fattier meats like beef, lamb, and pork. And you'll find them in high-fat dairy products like cream or high-fat cheeses or ice cream. And you tend to find them also in highly processed foods and palm oil and coconut oil. So those are not, those are two of the unhealthy oils to be cooking with, olive oil and coconut oil. Or sorry, palm oil and coconut oil. Olive oil is a good one. You also get saturated fats, as I mentioned, in ice cream and many desserts and baking products. Um, you'll find them in deep fried foods like fish and chips, French fries, foods that have too much cheese, hard margarine rather than soft margarine, lard if you're cooking with fat and with butter. So the saturated fats tend to cake up in our arteries and increase the unhealthy cholesterol, what we call LDL cholesterol that contributes to narrowing of the arteries and heart disease. So I think I probably covered most of your favorite foods. Yeah, we sometimes tell patients that rule of thumb is if it tastes really good and it's really satisfying, better double check to make sure it's not unhealthy for you. So highly processed foods include sugary drinks, ice cream, frozen desserts, and candy. Uh, they contain a lot of simple sugars in a high degree, sometimes a lot of extra sodium or salt and often saturated fats. And again, fast food, hamburgers, french fries, chocolates, all these things that we crave for. Frozen meals, sausages and deli meats, muffins, buns, and cakes. Again, highly processed and much higher in fat than sodium. So the best drink of choice is probably water. So try to replace those sugary drinks like juice and pop with water. It's nice that there's a lot of um, low sodium, low sugar drinks available. Um, that are bubbly, um, just watch to make sure they don't contain too much sodium. And as I mentioned, start reading the food labels. Uh, there's a nutritional facts table. So the standard in Canada is the first ingredient you see on the list on the ingredients on a label for any product you buy in the store is usually the ingredient that weighs the most. Uh, watch out for things that you might be allergic to and note the expiry or best before date, especially when you're buying things in bulk. 
So the Canada Food Guide, that's the website that you can read more about Canada's Food Guide, but that's the, uh, the guide uh, in a nutshell. So there are certain health conditions where we recommend specific diets. So ask your family doctor before you make any major changes, what type of diet is best for you and your health and your family history? So again, none of this should be taken as medical advice, but really uh, it's general information that, and if you have specific medical conditions or particular goals um, in your lifestyle and diet, then talk it over with your family doctor. So if you have diabetes or the precursor to diabetes, which is glucose intolerance, it means that our body cannot manage glucose in all its forms in our diet. Glucose is used for energy for every cell in our body, including our neurons, our brain cells. Uh, but with diabetes, we don't metabolize or break down that sugar very well. Our bodies have an organ called the pancreas that produces, secretes insulin, and that helps us our body metabolize or break down glucose and use it for energy. So people with diabetes should not be fasting. With diabetes, you want to keep the sugar levels fairly even so that we're able to manage the blood sugars without big ups and downs. So three principles would be one, frequent smaller meals rather than one big meal or skipping your breakfast. Uh, portion control. So managing how much you're eating, not only calories, but the, what's on your plate, which we'll see in a second. Very similar to Canada's food guide. And the principle of low glycemic index. So I'll get into that as well. So you'll see this looks very similar to the Canada food guide, but this was first a recommended diet for diabetes. So again, half the plate should be vegetables and a variety is, is even better. Uh, we should consume on the starchy side grains um, or starches such as potato, rice, corn, and pasta. And of those, we pay attention to what we mentioned, the glycemic index. And I'll talk to that in a second. And the core of the plate would be protein sources, beet or alternatives such as fish, beans, or lentils. One fresh fruit per meal is usually manageable for people with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Uh, but we definitely don't want to concentrate a bunch of fruits into a glass of juice. So using making smoothies may be too much sugar for your body to break down and metabolize without making your blood sugar go too high and uh, cause negative consequences. And of course, water or skim milk or low-fat milk is a good alternative for drinking. The Canadian Diabetes Association, which is diabetes.ca, has a wealth of information on their website on the the diet for diabetes and prediabetes. So another way of looking at portion sizes would be, of course, vegetables, which should be off your plate. So as much as you can hold in both hands, you can eat those vegetables. For grains and starches, which is the quarter of the plate, should be about the size of your fist or the size of a regular fruit. For milk or alternatives, drinking one cup of low fat milk is appropriate as a portion size. And for meat, or protein alternatives about the size uh, or in, about the size of the palm of your hand and the thickness of your little finger. And the amount of fat we should have is about the tip of your thumb. So glycemic index. It's a measure of how quickly a carbohydrate or starchy food um, allows your blood sugar to rise. So a food with high glycemic index, like white rice, will make your blood sugar go up faster than a lower glycemic index alternative, such as brown rice. And the similar things with white bread, highly processed, will tend to make our blood sugars go up higher. So high glycemic index, so not so good if you have diabetes or trying to lose weight, versus low glycemic index, whole wheat bread, whole grain bread which will make our sugars go up a little bit slowly so we can burn them off. So other examples of lower glycemic index foods, which are desirable for people with diabetes or glucose intolerance would be quinoa, whole grains and brown rice. Again, they raise the blood sugar more slowly than the high glycemic index foods, such as the bagels, white bread, and muffins. So again, for more information, a lot of detail, diabetes.ca for the Canadian Diabetes Association. 
So it's a nonprofit society that's not really trying to sell you anything except maybe memberships, the Canadian Diabetes Association, but is recognized as providing very objective evidence-based information for the public at large, but also for healthcare provision, uh, providers as well. So they actually produce a lot of our guidelines for the management of diabetes. If you have atherosclerosis or nar narrowing or hardening of the arteries, um, you would want a diet that's lower in the saturated fats, those like animal fat or high fat dairy products. So you want less of that to lower that bad cholesterol we call the LDL cholesterol. And you want to raise the good cholesterol, what we call HDL, um, high density lipoprotein. So that's the healthy cholesterol that helps reverse or stabilize narrowing of the arteries. So examples include those fatty fish that we mentioned and uh, olive oil, um, and then avoiding the unhealthy types of oils. If you have heart failure, which is reduction in the pumping action of the heart, so people with heart failure, uh, that could be the end result of years of high blood pressure or coronary artery disease. The heart muscle doesn't pump as strongly. It also decreases in strength as we get older. So my heart function at my age is much better than it would be when I'm 80 years old. So heart function reduces with time and worsened by certain conditions like high blood pressure or narrowing of the arteries. It could also be reduced by certain metabolic conditions like hemochromatosis where iron deposits in the heart muscle. So if people have heart failure, they would be more short of breath when they're exerting themselves like walking up a hill. They might feel short of breath when they're lying down at nighttime because the heart's not able to pump up all the, the fluid throughout the body and the fluid backs up into the lungs. And then we're short of breath if we have heart failure when lying down. And people with heart failure may have swelling in their legs or ankles although there's other causes for edema or swelling of the ankles too. So people with heart failure need to limit extra fluids. So if they drink too much fluids, including water, their body could be overloaded because the heart can't pump all that out of their body. And people with heart failure also have to limit their salt or sodium. So they're reading labels to really limit their amount of sodium in their diet to less than two milligrams, so a little pinch, less than a teaspoon. Um, so limiting sodium because salt tends to make us retain water and raises the blood pressure. And if you have high blood pressure, in addition to a low salt or sodium diet, um, there's recommended the DASH diet. So DASH actually doesn't stand for anything, but it's similar to the Mediterranean diet. So lots of fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, consuming low or non-fat dairy like skim milk or 1%, a variety of whole grain products, high in fiber, low to moderate in fat, and again, the healthy fats like olive oil or fish or poultry, and rich in potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So this particular diet was shown with evidence to help lower blood pressure as well. So people who are vegan will not consume any kind of meat or fish or poultry or eggs or dairy. Um, so that requires a little extra planning to make sure you get sufficient protein because of course, animal fat has a lot of, tends to have a lot of protein, but it's a bit of a challenge to, to get that through a, a purely vegan diet. Um, you could also be deficient in iron. You'd have to consume big bushels of spinach to get enough iron. So a lot of people on a vegan diet should talk to their doctor about getting their blood levels for at least iron and B12. And you may want to also take a vitamin D supplement. Omega-3 fats we tend to get from um, a variety of foods, including fish. Um, so we have to be extra careful so we get enough of that into our diet as well, because those are, again, healthy fats. So healthy eating on a budget. So it's always best to cook at home instead of eating out again, because it tends to be higher in calories, higher in sugar, higher in sodium. And it's useful to cook extra portions. So when my sister cooks a dinner for us, so she actually cooked for us on her birthday on April 16th. 
she actually cooked double, like double of what we needed for our small family that was there. Because my sister is so thoughtful and generous, she made enough so people could have two more meals to take home after the dinner. But that's a very efficient way, uh, cost effective on a day to day basis of cooking extra portions so that you have some leftovers for future meals of home cooked meals and have something for your lunch so you don't have to buy something from the cafeteria or the fast food restaurant. It's also really good and cost effective to keep an inventory of what's in your pantry, what you have at home. So you should use what you have before it expires, before you buy some more, even if it's on sale. And we should plan our meals. So make a shopping list for the whole week and make plans of who's cooking. So at our house, I'm so lucky, my kids are old enough and they're very good chefs. So the kids take turn cooking. Uh, so they have their nights for cooking as well. And uh, we've learned a lot of great vegetarian meals with my son who's vegetarian. So we've, we've actually really expanded our variety and learned a lot of great tasty foods that are healthier for us. And read those labels, especially those best before dates and the unit costs. So my daughter reminded me when she was about five years old, we went shopping and she said, did you check the label? Mom always checks the expiry date. So you get that, that salad before it's gonna be expiring so you get an extra week out of it if you're careful and read the labels and know your prices for different foods and then buy things when they're on sale because they all eventually go on sale and different costs at different places so unless you're sharing with lots of family and friends you should buy what you need and not a lot more than that and plan ahead for healthy snacks like carrot sticks and other raw vegetables, maybe low-fat cheese or popcorn with a lot of butter on it, or yummy whole grain bread. Things that fill you up and are satisfying, but are not high in sodium or fat or sugar. So if we plan ahead and have healthy snacks, then we're less likely to break open the, the bag of potato chips. I think potato chips are such a cruel snack because when you look at the nutritional con content and the calories, they might say, this is the calories or sodium for 10 chips, but then no one stops at 10 chips because you just crave for the taste and the sensation. If I were to invent a healthier snack, it would probably be a potato chip that expands to a whole potato when you put it in your mouth. So if you don't choke on it, at least you'll feel satisfied with one chip. When you're eating on a budget, um, when you're looking at meats and the protein alternatives, we should buy larger packages on sale, divide them up and put them in the freezer. Um, so divide it so that when you're ready to cook that for a meal, you can just take out the single serving or you can team up with other families or relatives and then um, buy in bulk, which is cheaper when it's on sale and then divide it up if you can, if you have a freezer. And buying dried or canned beans and lentils or tofu, Eggs, canned fish, peanut butter are also good sources. For vegetables and fruits, you have to buy in season. So the most expensive watermelon I ever bought was 29 years ago when my wife was pregnant with my uh, oldest son. She had a craving for watermelon in the middle of the winter. And the only place I could get it at that time um, was a watermelon from Granville Island. It's the most expensive watermelon they ever bought. But again, nowadays, if you go to places like Costco, you get fruits from all over the world. And don't buy fruit that needs to be eaten right away. It's overripe because then it's going to go bad. Like the bananas will go bad before you have a chance to finish the whole bunch. And buy larger bags of frozen vegetables. Just watch the sodium content in frozen food uh, because then you can bring them out and you still get a lot of good nutrition, even if it's not totally fresh. And buying canned and frozen and dried fruit could be an alternative that lasts longer. And again, for the grains, buy your rice flour, oats and pasta in bulk, and buy whole grain bread in bulk, and then store the loaves that you're not eating this week in the freezer. That's what we do when we buy three or four loaves of bread. Um, as I mentioned, Burnaby's Primary Care Networks has a food network that's part of our community's social, emotional, and wellness support programs. So if you um, uh, 
want to know how you can support the local food network or the food banks, you can check with on our website or um, Burnaby's Primary Care Networks and the links that Leon has provided with us on the chat. So I'll talk briefly about each of these really popular diets that patients are always asking about. I might even start doing without telling me till after the fact and when I find out that their cholesterol is really high or their blood pressure went up or their blood sugars are out of control, I might find out after that they may have been on one of these three popular diets. Intermittent fasting, people usually go on that to lose weight. The keto diet, which people often go on also to lose weight, and the paleo diet. So I'll talk about the principles of each of these and um, the positive effects of them and the rationale for them, and also some of the downsides you should watch out for. And if you're thinking of doing any of these, because some of them are quite drastic, it needs to be understood within the context of your overall health. So a good person to talk to would be your family doctor to see if, if you're embarking on something that's quite drastic to lose weight or for other reasons, then talk to your family doctor to see if it's right for you. So the idea of intermittent fasting is not eating for a period of time, um, either each day or for a week. So there's, there's different variations. So these are three common variations. So the first is alternate day fasting. So eating normally one day and then fasting or eating a smaller meal the next day. There's the five to two type fasting. So you eat a normal diet for five days and fast for two days out of the week. And there's the daily time limited fasting. So just setting up a little window of time where you're not gonna eat. For example, eating normally during an eight hour time window and then not eating outside of that window. So the idea of intermittent fasting or the rationale for its proponents is it can help you lose weight by reducing calories. So that makes sense. That it also has been shown in some cases to increase human growth hormone and that might promote fat loss and muscle gain. Um, and it may reduce your natural insulin levels and that can help us burn our stored fat. So that's the rationale behind intermittent fasting. And the short-term benefits are clear, reducing the calories uh, and therefore losing weight. The downside is being really, really hungry and tired. Uh, sometimes when we're fasting, our brain is kind of stimulated um, and we might have difficulty sleeping. So you might have experienced that if you miss a meal, instead of feeling necessarily sleepy, that you feel kind of hyper. Um, and that's not really a good kind of hyper. Um, a lot of people feel nauseous and can get headaches, particularly people with migraine headaches, because varying the blood sugar can trigger an acute migraine headache. It is definitely not safe in pregnancy or when you're breastfeeding. And as I mentioned with diabetes, when we wanna keep fairly even levels of sugars in our body. And it can worsen a lot of medical conditions, including gout or kidney stones. The keto diet. So the idea of the keto diet is basically a high fat diet that's really low in carbs. So not eating like a lot of whole, not a lot of grains or starchy foods or sugary foods. And the rationale is that when your blood sugars drop after three or four days on a keto diet that's high in fat and often animal fat, the body thinks it's starving and it starts breaking down fat and protein. It's usually we break down the sugar first before we start working on the fat and then the protein for energy. And the short-term benefits are weight loss. So a lot of people are able to lose weight in a short amount of time with the keto diet. Uh, it tends to decrease the blood sugar levels, obviously, by reducing all the starchy foods. Right? It's pretty well a no glycemic index diet. And it decreases supposedly inflammation in the body. So that's not really proven, but a lot of people have lost weight in the short term. Um, the downside is that after a period of time, you end up consuming a lot more fat than you can burn, and then you'll end up gaining weight. Um, and also because of the higher fat, animal fat diet, that you're gonna increase the cholesterol, and then therefore your increased risk for diabetes and heart disease. It can also cause harm to your kidneys uh, by 
producing that, that ketoacidosis, which is part of that keto diet. So that can uh, actually end up harming the kidneys and increasing your body fat. So the keto diet is a really hard one to sustain, although a lot of people can lose a good deal of weight in the short term. It's very hard to sustain that weight loss and not healthy in a lot of uh, conditions. So another one of those that you should run by your doctor who knows your personal and family history before you embark on the drastic keto diet. So the paleo diet is a bit different. So the paleo diet is eating foods that were similar to what humans ate in the Paleolithic era when we looked like, like cavemen about 2.5 million to 10,000 years ago. That's when we were just hunting and gathering, not farming at all. So the foods that our ancestors ate in the Paleolithic era included lean meats, fish that we can catch, fruits and vegetables that we can pull from the trees and nuts and seeds that we can pick. It contained no dairy products because we didn't have farms and uh, herds of cows, no legumes, potatoes, or grains. And the rationale is that it theoretically would be a better match for our genetics. Um, so, and the question was, has the addition of those later things after our evolution, has the addition of grains and legumes and dairy products caused the obesity, diabetes, and heart disease that we see today? So that's that philosophy of the paleo diet. So the benefits, of course, initially are weight loss, improved glucose tolerance, and better blood pressure control. But the downside is that not having the whole grains and legumes and the absence of dairy products as sources of protein and calcium, um, there can be excess protein from uh, the meats that we eat that may harm the kidneys. And it also tends to be quite expensive as well. So. As I mentioned, with any of these drastic diets, please consult with your family doctor before you consider starting these diets or any other major lifestyle change. So I'd like to share some tips on how to change your lifestyle or start any kind of goal that you really want to achieve. So number one would be to choose wisely. Choose a goal that matters to you and is kind of aligned with what you value. Visualize yourself having achieved that goal. So kind of reshaping your identity. I am a person that consumes healthy foods and enjoys putting, uh, giving my body the fuel it needs to get through my day and to be my best self. And visualizing kind of primes the pump for success. So we can see our goal or the end of the road. It kind of motivates us to take that first step and then every step along that way. Break down that big goal, that humongous goal of eating a perfect diet to something that's manageable. Turn that mountain into a molehill because that will increase your confidence. And when you conquer that molehill, you can climb another molehill a little bit bigger than that. And it just compounds our confidence that we can make positive changes in our life. It's that growth mindset rather than the fixed mindset, knowing that we are all a work of art and a work in progress. Writing down the details really commits us not only on paper, but it really makes us more determined and more likely to achieve our goals. So there's been studies that show if you write down your goal, you're 10 times more likely to achieve it. And you may have heard of SMART goals, but of course in Burnaby, we came out with the SMARTest goals. So SMARTEST is an acronym for the key things you should think about when you're setting any kind of goal. Number one, it should be specific. What are you going to do and where are you going to do it? M has to be measurable, how much and how long. A is achievable, realistic and doable. R is relevant, important to you and your health. And T is for time frame. When are you going to start? When are you going to finish before revising and wrapping up your goal? E is for evaluate. How did I do and what did I learn? And E is enjoyable, make it fun. S is stepping forward. So once you've done this goal, what am I gonna do next? And T is for together. 
Who will I work with to help me achieve my next goal? Who will I share my success with? And who will I bring along for the next step? So smartest goals only in Burnaby. And we need to anticipate and prepare for roadblocks before we face them. So for example, if your goal is to be more physically active and to go for a walk every single day, what are you gonna do when it snows and rains, which it can happen anytime right now, even tonight or last week. So pick an alternative so that if you can't go for your walk, or if it's raining, then you're gonna have a bright yellow umbrella and a bright rain jacket with lights so that you can do it safely. And if it's gonna be snowing, then you have your boots ready and you're gonna be visible and you're gonna go out with a friend and go for a walk anyway. And six, enlist support. So consult with your healthcare provider, usually your family doctor, and find a coach or teammate. So about, so, Extra coaches you can find through healthlink.ca healthy eating. Canada Food Guide is a good reference. Dial a dietitian if you have a quick question about, so it's a free service, 811, if you have some quick questions about diet or food. And some more tips from James Clear's Atomic Habits. So uh, if you'd like to know more about uh, some of the key tips, practical ways of achieving positive change in any aspect of your self-care. Um, that's a topic of one of our Empowering Patients talks that are available on video with handouts as well. So I do a more deeper dive in James Clear's Atomic Habits. So James Clear just kind of summarized what we know about habit formation, how particular behaviors become natural over time with repetition. So the keys are, number one, the cue for that habit. Number two, the craving for anticipating doing that behavior. Three is the response to the behavior. And four is the reward. Cue, craving, response, and reward. That's called the habit loop of anything you want to achieve and habits you already have. For example, the cue can be the context or trigger. Such as when you're bored, that seems to be something that triggers maybe habitual eating or having a snack or chips or a can of pop or a beer or a smoke. Um, sometimes the TV is that trigger where we become couch potatoes. C is for craving. So that's the desire for junk food or chocolate or a drink. And the response can be that behavior like grabbing a bag of chips or lighting a cigarette or having a drink. And the reward is the immediate positive feedback. And that's the satisfaction. Like Wimpy finally eating his 15 hamburgers. So satisfying for the moment, like how I feel after eating a hamburger, soon followed by feeling kind of blah. So how do we use these four components of habits to create a good habit? So in James Clear's Atomic Habits, you have to make the cue obvious. So one cue could be putting a fruit bowl on top of the TV or in front of the TV. So it reminds you instead of going to the pantry and grabbing a bag of chips that you can easily just grab an apple or an orange or banana. So it reminds you to do the right thing. And for craving, you wanna make that as attractive as possible. Pair an action you want to do with an action you need to do. For example, if you, um, if you want to exercise more, then you'll tell yourself that after you go to the gym or go for the walk, then you'll call up one of your best friends or maybe even better, uh, meet up with your best friend when you're going to the gym or going for a walk. So pairing things together, things you really uh, need to do for your health, pair it with something that you naturally want and enjoy doing to make it more attractive. So find ways of making it uh, easier or more pleasant to do the right thing. And that behavior we wanna do, we wanna make it as easy as possible. So very little friction or barriers. So if you wanna drink more fluids in the form of water, then you keep a pitcher of water on your desk or a water bottle. Um, so it gives you that constant reminder to have a drink of water rather than having a coffee extra coffee or 
eating something that's high in sugar, high in fat or alcohol. And keep your fridge stocked with fresh fruit. So it's really easy just to go there and, and grab some fresh fruit. And then most importantly, you want to make a reward to make it satisfying, to have that positive feel-good feeling. So sometimes it's useful just to keep a log about how many fresh fruits you have a day, aiming to have maybe five or seven fresh fruits per day. So maybe keep a tally that you have on your phone or a little check mark that you can do, because just checking things off seems to be good for the human brain and kind of rewarding you. But the other um, is to just have a little celebration, to give yourself a high five when you're doing the right thing, because that gives you a, it sounds silly, but saying, way to go, I nailed it, I did it, even something really simple and small, it's a new behavior. And if you give yourself that feel good feeling that reinforces that behavior, it just stimulates dopamine in your brain and makes it almost like addictive to do the right thing. So celebrate immediately to trigger those positive emotions, nailed it. Give yourself a thumbs up, do a touchdown dance so no one's looking. So if you wanna get rid of a bad habit, we do the opposite. We make the cue less visible. So if your cue is watching TV makes you eat, then move the TV out of the way in the closet and read a book instead. Or pre-record your favorite TV shows and fast forward through all the commercials so you don't get those reminders to start snacking on chips or to order from Uber Eats. For the craving, you wanna make it less attractive. So associate negative feelings with the habit. Remember the downsides. It's like the yucky pictures on cigarette packages. So you remind you about the bad things about smoking and the harm to your body or reminding yourself how yucky you felt when you last ate some fast food or had a bunch of fries or a fatty pizza. So maybe a picture or reminder to remind you to make that craving less attractive. And make it more difficult to do that behavior. So don't have any alcohol or junk food in your home. Create obstacles to make it harder. This little picture is an example of a little safe to lock up your tempting snack foods. Um, and then hiding the key. And again, make that bad habit less satisfying. So you can make a contract to report to your best friend or your partner, and you have to pay them money when you give into that bad habit. So that makes it very unsatisfying. And then, uh, yeah, and then share your successes because we're all, we can't do any of this alone so if you want to create a new habit and get rid of bad habits create your own support network it doesn't have to be aa or na but just having that good support habit that 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 really is the, the biggest victory when we can support one another inspire one another so this is one of our original box with your docs before we the pandemic and before mass uh, but last September, we had a great walk with your doc where uh, the whole community came together, including uh, Mayor Hurley, and uh, we all walked around the track in safe social distancing. And so I look forward to seeing all of you in person in September um, with another safe walk with your doc as well. So I covered a lot of material in a short time, and I have plenty of time to answer your questions about healthy eating, about good and bad habits, and anything else you want, including what to do if you don't have a family doctor, which is the, the topic of 60% of people out there in Burnaby. That was so. great. Um, yeah, we do have some some questions here, Dr. Wong. Uh, Teresa's asking, what about Coke Zero or Diet Pepsi uh, with a drink for a drink with food? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, now, you have to remind me if Coke Zero has zero sodium too, because most of the time, any bubbly drink has sodium bicarbonate, so it's higher in sodium. So on the label, you can see there's zero sugar and then zero caffeine, um, but read the labels carefully. So the caffeine is that stimulant that might keep us awake or give us energy or make mm -hmm. us feel sharper if we need it. 
uh, and it depends. Uh, the studies that are done show that it doesn't necessarily help you lose weight to go with the diet drinks. But if you had no choice on a hot day and you don't have reduced sodium, then of course a diet Coke is probably better, but we don't know what's in that secret formula. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We know it's not cocaine because that'd be too expensive, like in the original formulation of Coca Cola. So there's no oh, cocaine right. there. Uh, but that'd be too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they must have had so much fun in the old days and wow. not a heart attack in those days. Yeah, too. I was going to say then a crash and burn after, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe it might be better to have a nice, cool, clean glass of water with ice in it. Sounds great. Um, so our next question comes from Emily. Uh, she asked, does egg whites contain the most protein compared to egg yolk? Yeah, there's so a lot of bodybuilders um, that don't want to increase their cholesterol or triglycerides will have the egg whites. And you can buy containers of egg whites so you can separate the yolk. Uh, the yolk is that satisfying part that every kid loves and most adults do too, but the Egg white is very is the part that's higher in protein, lower in fat. So that's the healthiest part of your egg. Great. Um, Craig asks, are there any fast food restaurants that do offer healthy or healthier food? If so, what items? Yeah, so you can actually see in a lot of menus that there are heart healthy options. They usually have a little icon on, on the menu. Um, and those tend to be lower in sodium, lower in fat. At any fast food restaurant, you can ask for their little, um, it's almost like a label you, you get on packaged food, but it'll tell you the fat content, sugar content, sodium content of that Big Mac or that Whopper. So it tells you how much you're consuming as well. And there are healthier alternatives. So if you were going to have fast food, then maybe at a Subway, you might pick the whole wheat bread, careful what you put on for a spread, something that's low fat, low sodium, and maybe pick chicken or turkey breast. Um, but it, they, they do process foods and sandwich meats tend to be higher in sodium. So pay attention to the sodium content. And just because, like I like the taste of the impossible patty if I go to white spot. So if I have a Monte mushroom burger, I always pick that vegetarian alternative, but I have no idea how they actually make it. So it is satisfying. I know I'm not, I'm better for the environment because it didn't involve um, cattle and the greenhouse effect, but it probably is higher in sodium and it is highly processed as well. So you have, we have to be careful about those fake meats or the vegetarian type meats. Um, we have to do a little bit more research if we're gonna eat those on a regular basis. And it's probably better to have the more natural sources of uh, vegan and vegetarian protein. So there are healthy alternatives, but you have to look at it with a kind of a critical eye as well and uh, see if you can look at the contents, which is available at most commercial restaurants. That's where that M word, the moderation word comes in. I'm vegetarian and I make sure that I spread out anything soy based and uh, uh, or the, the the fake stuff. It's kind of a treat. I have once in a while, but not something I eat on a regular basis. So that's, um, that's right. So what we eat once in a while is okay. <laughs> so I know at Christmas time or birthdays, I tell my patient, well, enjoy every little bite of your little treat. <laughs> so don't eat it mindlessly. Enjoy every moment of it. And yes. is what we eat on a regular basis. It's more important than what we eat once a month or a couple times a season. That's right. Um, how does sugar, how does sugar replacements, example, Splenda affect our health? Uh, we don't know. Of course, you've seen studies that uh, the substitutes like saccharin can cause cancer in mice, but have not been shown to cause cancer in, in human beings. So that might be an alternative if you have that craving for sugar. But it's probably better to eat natural if we can. And I learned to enjoy coffee without putting any sugar into it. So, and only skim milk in my coffee or tea. And you learn to enjoy a 
nice clean glass of water or tea without having all the extras in it as well. And you enjoy the sweetness of a fresh fruit rather than having it kind of baked into a cookie or a pie. Um, do you endorse almond and oat, oak milk? Oat milk. Yeah, so those are good alternatives and actually doesn't go too bad in my coffee too. So sometimes we run out of milk and then I'll use my son's oat milk or almond milk. And it's actually pretty smooth. Um, and so they're good sources of protein, but read the labels because it's not necessarily a substitute for calcium and vitamin D. So um, even a glass of milk, it has vitamin D added to it. So it's vitamin D enriched. So likewise, if, you're, uh, if your kids are drinking soy or almond milk, um, you want to make sure the kids have enough calcium too. So make sure there's enough calcium in the diet or vitamin D added to the almond or oat milk to make sure you get those nutrients if you're not getting it elsewhere. Great. And this question is from Sandy and myself. Uh, could you please comment on red wine? Uh, well, the only reason that we haven't told people not to drink is that there's probably lots of doctors that like to drink their red wine in the evening after a hard day, after they after a long day and then three hours of all the paperwork <laughs> and tasks. They're not there yet, but alcohol is not good for you. <laughs> so <laughs> alcohol raises the good cholesterol, but it also raises our risk for cancer. It raises our heart rate, it raises our blood pressure. It actually is a toxin for many of our cells. So, but there's so many people that are just socially attached to having that glass of wine. So. As long as doctors are drinking, we're always going to have red wine and people saying that it's good for you. <laughs> so it, it, for some people, it will raise the good cholesterol, but we can raise it by eating healthy omega-3 and 6 fats. Fish, cardio exercise raises the good cholesterol. A better way than consuming alcohol, which has a lot of calories, affects our mood. It's a real dirty drug because at first it relaxes us and then it stimulates us. So I don't know if you noticed that, but if I had a drink, I could feel really sleepy and relaxed and silly. And then a couple hours later, wide awake. So we often wake up in the middle of the night and it can turn into like an addiction or dependence because we have to have another drink to calm down from the excitement from having that drink a couple hours later. Nice. So uh, a lot of negative things, bad for people with migraines like myself. So if I had a glass of red wine or white wine or beer, I can pretty well guarantee I'm going to get a migraine that evening or the next day. So my body tells me, and, and if you drink regularly and you just cut out the alcohol, you might be surprised how good you start feeling. Uh, not the same good feeling you have right after you drink, but <laughs> just on a day-to-day -day basis, your energy level, your alertness, your mood because it really is kind of mind altering and it is to toxic and causes a variety of cancers. Uh, and it does contribute to breast cancer as well. Okay. Um, there's a lot of con confusion about soy consumption and breast cancer risk. Any commenting would be appreciated. Yeah, so huge amounts of soy can increase estrogen levels and many breast cancers are estrogen sensitive. So consuming lots of soy doesn't cause breast cancer, but people that happen to have a, a estrogen receptor sensitive breast cancer, um, that can cause that to grow at the same time. But reasonable moderate amounts of soy are healthy for men and women. Okay, great. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who is already pre-diabetic? Just a little carb would push my blood sugar high and stay up for hours. Thank you. Yeah, so you choose, uh, if you're having carbs and choose the low glycemic index versions, and to also burn down the sugars is to be physically active. So it doesn't mean you have to go for a run after every meal and snack, um, but you can do stuff around the house, uh, cleaning up at the house, just whatever you do, just don't sit down after that meal. So do some physical activity in that hour or so after, so that can modulate the sugars from going too high. And you know, glucose monitors are really useful if you're pre-diabetic because you can see the effect 
of particular types of foods and meals and portion sizes and your physical activity as well. So my brother was recently diagnosed with prediabetes and he just went out and bought that continuous glucose monitor. Um, so you see it advertised already, it's just you stick on the sensor, it's super expensive, but it, it can show you on your phone continuously what your sugar is like. And he just saw the immediate feedback of walking all the time and choosing the right foods, carbs that are lower in glycemic index and the effect on his blood sugar. And he was able to modulate it without taking any medication. Um, but those monitors are only covered by PharmaCare in specific conditions, usually if you require insulin to monitor your sugar. So it's very particular and has to be really difficulty monitoring with a regular glucose monitor. But if you have prediabetes, it's worthwhile getting a glucose monitor and seeing the effects of your diet and activity. So I would recommend in addition to smaller amounts of carbs, just a quarter of the plate, and then low glycemic index versions of those like whole grain or brown rice, um, those things that are less processed would be better and less likely to raise the sugar. And then physical activity, including dancing after you have your meal, going for a walk, being physically active, doing stuff around the house or outside the house after you have each meal or snack. Great. And these resources, um, the diabetic specific ones are, I think you've included some in the information sheet and we've shared the, um, the di diabetes.ca website in the chat. So there's lots of good information there. Um, how many apples a day can a diabetic eat? Well, the general recommendation is one portion of fruit, like it could be one apple or one orange or one banana per meal, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and one portion of fruit per snack, like middle of the morning, middle of the afternoon. So those are, for most people with diabetes, those are reasonable amounts. Um, so one portion of berries would be like half a cup, the same with things like cherries that would be equivalent to one fruit. You definitely don't want to eat half a watermelon or a big fruit salad or a smoothie that, that you had to squeeze three oranges and two bananas that you can consume in a couple of gulps. So our, our bodies are more designed eating one portion of fruit, which is quite filling. Um, so I don't eat my five apples all at once. I kind of space them out throughout the day. But fortunately, I don't have prediabetes either. <laughs> um, also, if someone can't drink water, what's something that they can substitute for that hydration? Mm, I'm not sure why anyone would be not able to drink water, but able to drink something else. Because our bodies are 60% water. So, so you can't be allergic to water. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had troubles drinking water, then you probably couldn't drink anything else either. So I'm pretty sure everyone that can drink can drink water. You might have to use hypnosis so you can imagine it has alcohol in it <laughs> or, or that it has flavors. Yeah, I sometimes get disappointed if I have something like a bubbly drink or, a, or one of those flavored drinks and it has a picture of a fruit on it. It has the name of the fruit but then you have to really struggle so hard to taste that fruit because it's so dilute. So, um, but flavoring things, if you don't like plain water, then you could have tea, still very low in calories and no fat, no sodium, or lemon, a uh, little bit of lemon, as long as you don't have any acid problem, you can flavor the water a little bit too. I guess if you can't, drink the water because you're going to choke. You could have ice chips like we do with pregnant women <laughs> when they're in labor where they don't want them to drink. Um, and again, people with heart failure, kidney failure, we might limit the amount of fluid, water, or other fluids as well. So pretty all, all the fluids are equivalent when we're restricting the amount of fluids people consume. Oh, so the follow-up comment was, I do not drink alcohol, can't drink water, and, and diabetic. So that's the so the three um, sort of components for, for that uh, person. Yeah, so I, I really can't think of any condition where you can't drink water. Hmm. 
Well, there's a few options in there. Yeah. Um, I cut ice cubes, but we we can get fluids also. We also get fluids from the foods that we eat as well, like watermelon, lots of fluid. A lot of fruits have fluid as well. Right. Um, I've got a question. Um, I have a child with ADHD uh, who needs to gain weight. She usually skips lunch. Is the food pyramid model, especially the half fruits and veggies, enough to help her gain weight, or should I plump her up with additional snacks and high fat foods? Yeah, they got rid of that full food pyramid with the Canada Food Guide. So look at the new Canada Food Guide. So you want to make sure it also talks about how much protein we need at different ages. So of course, growing children need more protein. And um, we have a decreased protein as we lose muscle mass as well. So it's dependent on weight and your gender and your activity level. But it's important to especially with a child that so you actually look you have to look at everything they're eating to see what their overall uh, healthy fat content that they're consuming, make sure they're getting enough nutrients, make sure they don't need vitamins if they're not eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, uh, make sure there is enough protein. And as you can see, there's a variety of ways of getting protein. Um, like even with a vegan diet, we can get enough protein. Great. Well, that's it. I think you've answered everybody's questions here, unless there's any more last minute ones you want to pop into the chat. Any other questions? I, I know you've probably seen lots of stuff in the media about the crisis in family doctors. Mm. Family doctors burning out, so hard to find a family doctor. Recent study, 44% of people are worried that if they do have a family doctor, they're worried about losing their family doctor because a lot of uh, people, when your family doctor retires and you're kind of stuck and going on all the waiting lists to find a family doctor. And part of what we tried to do with our divisions of family practice when we founded it back in 2011, 2011 or 2000, 2011, 2012, I think that was around when we started. I think it's- Yeah, 2011. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it was to, to increase the availability of family doctors, attract more family doctors into each of our communities and to connect patients and attach them to family doctors. Because we do know from the big studies um, around the world, Barbara Starfield in particular, um, did research to show that in communities where there is a high degree of attachment to family practices, family doctors, those people have fewer hospitalizations, better health outcomes, and lower cost care overall. So great benefit to having a doctor that you know over time that's looking out for you and advocating for you. But it's a kind of a crisis because of population growth and then doctors retiring and a lot of doctors not doing the full service family practice. So full service family practice today means looking after people from babies to the elderly, um, seeing your patients in the office, but when I started practice, full service family practice was doing palliative care, delivering babies at the hospital, um, uh, doing house calls, residential care for our patients that are in long-term care, uh, the whole spectrum and doing everything um, from babies to the elderly, to palliative care, to cancer care. So that's still, that, that was full scope, full service family practice. But majority of family doctors now, they look after all ages, all genders, but most do not do deliveries. And after 31 years, I just gave up my deliveries last week so I can catch up on sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was only one of two family docs that were still delivering their own patients at Burnaby Hospital. And it's quite a rarity in the city more likely in smaller communities. And most family docs don't do palliative care for their patients, but I do follow my patients when they're getting home care to do the home visits to the end of life, unless they're in the, the hospice where there are now palliative care physicians that just round on the patients. And I have been seeing my patients in the nursing home, but recently now the nursing homes, as soon as our patients moved to long-term care, they're being assigned to physicians that do residential care. 
So there's been kind of a carving away of our full scope. And in the olden days, we used to admit patients to the hospital, but most of my colleagues don't have hospital privileges anymore because there's a subgroup of family docs that do hospitalist medicine and only do the hospital stuff and don't do the, the rest of the practice long-term care or longitudinal care. So because doing full service family practice is very difficult. So medicine has always been really challenging because we deal with a variety of emotional, social, uh, medical problems, lots of uncertainty, difficulty access to tests. Uh, but now it's even more difficult uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm talking on a computer. It's the same computer that I have to use to do all my consultations with patients, either by telehealth or in person. And at the end of the day, I spend three hours going through all the information that comes in through the electronic medical record or computer. And that's lab results, reports. I spend at least an hour a day on forms. And if I have a, a big report to do on a patient for a car accident, that could take a whole afternoon or a day. So every form that a patient brings to the office is like, I was just telling my colleague, Dr. Breyer, uh, we used to say that a cigarette takes five minutes out of your life. So every form a patient comes in kind of takes 20, 20 minutes to two hours out of the personal life of your family doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and there are more forms that I get now to complete than I did when I started practice 31 years ago. And it used to take 15 minutes to go through the lab results that came in on paper because we only got one version of them. But now when you go to the lab to do the stool occult blood test for the colon cancer screen, I will get a task that I have to open up and file away that says, you picked up the kit. I will get another task in a couple of days that says you dropped off the kit. And I'll get another task a day later that says the result of that, that test. Likewise, if a patient goes for an electrocardiogram, I get, and I have to open the computers have not been designed to be doctor friendly. So it takes us so long to get through all these tasks. Um, it's faster for me to write a note than to do it by hand. So that's great. But it's all the other things that kind of create a huge headache for doctors so that our days are longer. The joy of medicine is our face-to-face -face time with patients and seeing positive changes and educating our patients, learning about their stories and their goals, and then helping them achieve the goals. Kind of like what I shared with you today. But the part that really drains our batteries low are the long hours at the end of the day when you are when we should be at home, where we're staying late at the office to complete all our charting, which is the lab results that came back. And that's minimum two hours, three hours every night. Either we do it here or we go home and do it when our wives and children are watching TV. So doctors are getting burnt out trying to do the full service. And also it's really expensive to run an office. So all the young doctors that I've mentored into practice, all but one, my partner, Dr. Breyer, has, is doing full service and hiring his own staff and sharing in the administrative work of our practice. But a lot of younger doctors don't want to do the administrative part. So it falls on the senior doctors to do it. And it's so much easier for doctors to work in the walking clinic and treat one problem at a time. When we see patients, they bring in three, four or five problems at a time and sometimes without warning. And it, it's really difficult because we have to think through the process for each problem. So there's a variety of things that have made family practice really difficult for us. And family doctors get paid a lot less than what specialists do. And I was just talking to my colleague today and he said, we just were wondering, how come when we refer to specialists on pathways, they can say, I don't do ICBC, I don't do WCB, I don't do these particular kind of problems. But when you see your family doctor, we have to look after everything, every problem. Um, but every other specialty doesn't have to do that. The college just has a different standard for that. And the specialists kind of download to the family doctor as well and ask us to do the special authority forms for you to get pharmacare coverage that we don't get paid for. So each form again takes minimum 15 minutes, 20, 30 minutes, even though it looks like a few blanks. We have to open the chart, go through the history and meet all the criteria. 
So that's the part of family practice we don't enjoy. And that's why a lot of the young doctors are not going into what we now call full service family practice. So you might hear next month, there's family, I think there's family doctor day that's coming up next month. So yeah, yeah so I think it's coming. Yeah, so I think we're planning a big event outside of prime care. I think as a joke, we actually won't show up because there's a short of family <laughs> doctor <laughs> and we have to get our work done. Yeah. No time. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's why there's a crisis and that's why um, um, people aren't going into family practice the same numbers as before or why they choose to work in walk-in clinics. When you go to the walk-in clinic and that doctor only treats your one problem and fills your prescription, he or she gets paid the same amount as when I see my patient in the office and treat three or four problems and go over their labs and then recommend things for the future and do all those referrals. We get paid the same amount, which is just a little bit over $30. Right. Yeah, and our overhead ranges from 55 to 65, 25 to about 35% for overhead. Wow. Yeah, we pay for the staff and all the equipment and things. So that may seem like a negative res, but I'm getting ready for family doctor day next month. <laughs> and I, I, I'm wondering what uh, we can do as a community to support your family doctor and appreciate your family doctor. Um, so if you do have a family doctor, please know all the work he or she does behind the scenes to keep you healthy. And to know it's our face-to-face -face time with you and keeping you healthy that really recharges our battery. That's why we do what we do. And um, things we do for our community, like the walk with your doc and these empowering patient programs where we can help so many more people, that's really gratifying too. Because now we know that we're giving not only to the people we can see in person, but we can reach out and enrich your lives and the people that you can share this information with as well. So that recharges my battery, even though I have to go home and work on the computer for a couple <laughs> more hours afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why there's a crisis because it's uh, yeah things have gotten more difficult over the past 30 years yeah it's tough but the burnaby division is working really hard to bring in new family doctors and i know there's a couple coming so um there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes um to try and and meet that need as best we can so yeah. And if any of my patients are out there, don't worry, I don't plan to retire soon. So <laughs> my, my dad told me, keep on working as long as you're having fun. And then he retired when he was 82. Yeah, 82. Yeah. So he's been only 10 years out of retirement. He just turned 92. <laughs> wow. That's great. Um, so just a couple more questions uh, before we run. Um, does rinsing the nose and mouth with mouthwash eliminate COVID? No, and Lysol doesn't work either. Yeah. <laughs> I think people tried to do that so that you would more likely test negative when you have to do the test for the airplane. So right. that was a strategy people used to kind of lower the viral load. So a rapid test will come back as a negative, but it won't eliminate COVID because they, yeah, those spike proteins have a way of really latching onto the mucous membranes, you know, respiratory mucosa in the nose, sinuses, throat, and chest. Right. Um, is there such a thing as the annual physical with your family doctor anymore? No, and it probably never was because MSP says that complete physicals are not covered unless there's a medical justification. So a patient will either have to have a chronic condition such as diabetes, heart disease, heart failure, where they have a condition that will affect multiple organs so it would warrant doing a complete head to toe check. Or if people that have a condition such as unexplained weight loss or extreme low energy where a physical exam is warranted. So not as a routine. That's why private physicals like your, some driver's medicals are not covered by medical. And um, that's why you don't, if someone's feeling really healthy, then they don't necessarily need a complete physical. It's not covered by MSP, but what you can do there, uh, we did our last talk was about um, screening tests, what you need at different ages. So it's useful to look back on that. I also went over the review of systems. So symptoms that would warrant seeing the doctor and asking uh, 
and they usually would require an in-person examination. And then the doctor can talk to you whether or not it actually warrants doing a complete physical. So it's something that the doctor has to justify to the medical services plan, not, so not as a routine. Because research suggested that doing a routine physical and healthy people at any age without any chronic conditions does not improve health outcomes. Although I like to think, because I'm really thorough in doing physical, that I will pick up something. But MSP would argue that a routine physical is not cost effective and therefore is not paid for by the medical services plan. Interesting, interesting. Um, I think this might be the last one. There's really lovely um, words of gratitude in the chat, Dr. Wong, if you want to take a, take a, a gander. Um, but um, is the fragmentation of family practice a good thing for continuity of care for the patient or not? Uh, personally, I say no, because as a family doctor, I'm an advocate for my patient. So I see, I don't treat disease. I only see a condition or a disease in the context of that person's life. So how we see things, how we view things, how we treat depends on that individual's life story and their goals. Um, so we're part of their story over a lifetime. We build trust and confidence over time. So you trust my judgments, my opinion, but I also trust that you share the intimate details of your life and your goals. So there's no such things in my practice as doctor's orders. It's the patient's goals that we share together and we work towards. I'm their coach, but their advocate over a lifetime. And I'm their advocate for the healthcare system. So when family doctors work in the hospital, we made sure that we pick up on any mistakes that come when there's too many cooks um, in the kitchen. So we catch mistakes that are made inevitably when there's so much um, complication, so many people involved. Um, but unfortunately, not uh, family doctors not being in any of our urban hospitals on a regular basis, then we can't be advocates for them in the hospital all the time. But we are there to make sure they get the tests and see the best specialist for their condition in as timely fashion as possible. Uh, my medical office assistant, Christina, um, loves my patients the same way I do and uses the same golden rule. So if we're trying to get a mammogram, we want to be urgent. Um, she knows she's going to have to call five or six places to find out who, is, who can do it fastest for that particular condition that needs it to be done right away. So it, it takes that extra effort, but because we have that personal relationship connection with our patients over time, we are their advocates. And I think if you just get episodic care and you don't have that relationship over time, not only do we lack that knowledge and background about your medical history, but we'd also lack that relationship of trust and knowing what your goals, your personal goals are and what your preferences are and to have that trusted conversation. Well, I think you did it. I think you covered it. We've got some lovely thank yous and um, uh, yes, th th uh, thoughts in the chat. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Uh, thank you all for spending the time with me and I hope you can share anything helpful and useful to the people you care about because we're, as a community, we look after everyone. Everyone's our neighbor. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Leona, for supporting us throughout the whole pandemic mm -hmm. and keeping our Empowering Patients program. My pleasure. My pleasure. This recording will be up on our website tomorrow morning. Uh, so yeah, I feel free to share the link with uh, with friends and family. I actually just shared with an old friend who was very appreciative of, of all the content. She had no idea sort of what was going on, what I did for a living, actually. <laughs> so it's good. It's, there's lots to share. Yeah. Leona does a lot more than than supporting empowering patients. She, she's involved in lots of the projects and managing uh, the division office and deals with a lot of uh, the uh, challenging personalities that make up their membership of family doctors. And so <laughs> thanks for keeping us all so happy. Leona. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, everybody, like I said, when I close down the, the session tonight, uh, just a brief, it's just, I think it's eight questions will pop up. It's a little survey just asking how we did. Um, and so if you could fill that in and if you want to be notified of our uh, about walk with your dog, we're hoping for mid September. Um, 
by all means, uh, there's a section there to add your email if you're not already on our list. So make sure you add it and you'll be invited to walk with your doc. Okay, thanks again, Liana. Good night, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.